it's time to start our meeting. Thank you everyone for being here. And um, this is the Ward 6 NPA meeting for Thursday, March 3rd. Um, I'm Michelle Moraz on the steering committee and also here from the steering committee is Joel Fitzgerald and Nelson Martell. We also have a steering committee member retired, Gail Rafferty, I see her. Committee member Emerita. So we're going to start the first part of our meeting, which is the public forum. And so I'm calling on anybody who would like to speak in this segment of our meeting. And I see Gail has her hand up. All right, should I go ahead, Michelle? Please do. Okay, hi everyone. Um, I just wanted to let people know that there's a Parks and Rec Commission meeting next week, um, Tuesday, March 8th at 5.30. Some neighbors in our neighborhood near Smalley Park are interested in this Parks and Rec Commission meeting because um, Councillor McGee from Ward 3 will be talking with Parks and Rec about an ordinance that he's proposing that would, um, drop the prohibition for camping in Burlington's parks. Um, it, it's a complicated ordinance if you have a chance to read it. Um, some of our neighbors are concerned, myself and some of our neighbors are concerned about this ordinance because there was a lot of camping in Smalley Park last summer. And while our neighborhood strongly supports Burlington coming up with options, especially for unhoused uh, folks to have an outdoor um, option for living in the warm weather. Um, doing so in Burlington's parks does not seem like a great idea to us. Um, I'm not here to debate that, but just to say that there, the, one of the first times that this ordinance will get any sort of airing <clears throat> will be Councillor McGee um, talking with Parks and Rec Commission next Tuesday at 5.30. And that's a Zoom link meeting at this point, I believe. And Michelle, I think uh, the link is gonna be posted somewhere up on the minutes for this meeting, I believe. Right, so it will be posted with the minutes on the CETA website. We can't post links during this Zoom. Sure. And um, um, Ben Traverse has said that um, Parks and Rec will also put the agenda and the link to that meeting up on every front porch forum sometime in the next couple of days, just to generally advertise the meeting, which is also gonna have something in it about Letty, Letty Park as well and uh, entrance fees. So anyway, that was it, really just an announcement. If anyone is interested pro or con in whether or not um, camping should be allowed in Burlington's parks and what sort of follow-up procedure should happen if it is happening, um, we just are hoping people will go and, and hear what Councillor McGee had in mind and, and um, we can all be aware. That was it. Great, thank you, Gail. Is there anyone else here who would like to make a public comment? Michelle, it looks like Jordan uh, had his, has his hand up. Okay, Jordan. Please go ahead. And Jordan is a she. Oh, I apologize. Sorry, Jordan. No problem. I actually, I don't need to make a public comment. I just did that to participate in the later discussion. Great. Okay. Thanks, Jordan. Um, all right, just a last call for public comments. It looks like Greg has a public comment. Go ahead, Greg. Okay, uh, I think I'm unmuted, am I? Yes. Okay, good. Yeah, thanks a lot. Um, yeah, for the uh, past several years, um, some of you uh, read the Front Porch Forum South Union and know that I've been 
concerned about the amount of uh, salt that's uh, being applied uh, sometimes indiscriminately. And um, I let uh, Spencer Chapin know my opinion about this. And, and um, it, over the past two years, uh, in last year's and this year's City of Burlington uh, annual financial report, um, Spencer gives a lot, very, very detailed summary of the activities of um, public works, but um, I have not seen any mention about the snow plowing and the application of salts. And uh, I would like to be able to, um, I, I would like him, I, he probably already does, the DPW, to keep track of the amount of salt, the amount of uh, time that the uh, snow plows are used on the sidewalks. And um, in other words, the number of the type of, uh, of uh, salt um, uh, that's used, uh, the uh, quantity, um, and uh, the also the uh, what would be the um, the algorithm that's used as to when it's applied, how much is applied, and, and that sort of thing. I've been walking uh, up to uh, UVM for quite a while, a um, number of times uh, this this winter, and um, I, I've noticed that, uh, for example, uh, Champlain College. There's enormous piles of, of salt, much, much too much salt uh, applied. And of course, uh, that when, when it uh, dissolves, uh, it goes into our water supply and into the lake. And I'm not sure how much of that can be extracted um, from the water uh, for our drinking purposes or from the lake. Um, also, uh, I'm ward clerk and I was uh, very concerned of Edmonds uh, auditorium or the gym, I should say, the amount of salt that was applied around Edmonds on the sidewalks and at the entrances, it was a lot which was tracked in on, onto the gym floor, unprotected gym floor. And um, so I'm, I was concerned not only of the custodians that had to clean that, had to clean that up for today's uh, classes and, and activities in the gym, but also the fact that um, I'm sure uh, a lot was ground into the finish of the school's floor, of the gym floor. So- um, Greg, I'm gonna just pause you for one second and just see, we only have a few minutes left for public comment. I wanna just see if there's anyone else who wants to make a public comment. And if not, I'll let you continue. Mm -hmm. Anyone else want to make a public comment in the three minutes we have left? Okay, I'm not seeing any hands. So Greg, go ahead. Yeah, sure. I can uh, just sum up uh, to repeat my concern. And that is, I would like to see the, uh, the type of protocol or the algorithm or whatever you would call it as to um, from uh, DPW in it, at least in the annual report as to the application of salt, the amount of uh, time that the uh, plows, no, the sidewalk plows are out and, uh, and have the facts and figures and and that sort of thing show up in the annual, in its annual, the DPW's uh, section of the, of the uh, annual report. That's all I have. Cool, thank you, Greg. <clears throat> okay. I don't believe anyone has joined us since my last call for public comments. So I'm going to then turn over the next item to steering committee member Nelson Martell. And this segment of our meeting will be elections for Ward 6 NPA steering committee members. Yeah, thanks, Michelle. Um, <clears throat> before, we, we, before we get into um, uh, election of new members, I just wanted to um, take a moment and acknowledge the effort um, and service of two of our outgoing uh, steering committee members, Michelle Mraz and Matt Grady, who's not here tonight. Um, they've both served five years on the Ward 6 MPA and um, just wanted to say thank you uh, for all the energy and enthusiasm and leadership. Um, I only participated for about a year with them, but um, I can say just from the, the planning meetings before the meeting, um, there's a, just a real commitment in uh, love for the community, Burlington at large, but our, our neighborhood here in Ward 6 too. So thank you, Michelle and Matt. <clears throat> You're welcome, um, Nelson. I appreciate your comments. All right. 
Um, so with that, I know we had um, a few folks uh, who have um, expressed interest in being on the steering committee. I see them here tonight. I see Dale Azaria and Chloe Tomlinson um, and wanted to open it up. Um, I, I know actually myself and, and Joel Fitzgerald are also interested in continuing on um, the steering committee um, and wanted to open it up and see if there's anyone else who's interested in um, participating. I don't see any hands. Um, so um, if that's the case, then I would say um, uh, I would open it up to a vote from all the members here on the, um, the four of us, I guess, if we could prove everyone at once, um, the four of us uh, being on the Ward 6 NPA steering committee for the next year starting. Um, and actually, I think our bylaws say that the new, the new um, uh, steering committee members would begin in in May. I would propose that, that they start um, in April if they're for, for the April meeting if they're available. Um, but uh, let's go ahead and, and have the vote. Any um, any opposition, let's say, to the four of us <laughs> continuing on the steering committee? Well, actually, Nelson, what we have to do is have two people from the floor nominate each of the candidates. Thank you. So it could be anybody who just says, I nominate X. I nominate Dale Azaria. Seconded. <laughs> Great. Uh, Robert, go ahead. I'll nominate um, you, Nelson. Thank you. I'll second that. Robert. I'll nominate Joel, too. <laughs> I'll second that. So, Chloe. I second that. Okay, Michelle, since I, I'm newbie to the process, um, is there something more <laughs> official beyond the nomination now? Is there yeah, a vote? Yeah, so we have to vote. So <clears throat> what we do at this segment is um, we'll, we'll vote by a show of hands, and I think it would make most sense to um, just have our slate of candidates be reelected all together. And that would just require the people who are present to raise their hand if they agree with the, or uh, vote for these nominees to become steering committee members. I want to pick you up on the way to go get it or on my way back. Michelle, could I just note that um, not everybody is necessarily eligible, not everybody president, present is eligible to vote. I am not eligible to vote because I live in Ward 5. Yes, so that's a very- I didn't want people to think I'm not voting for them because I'm not, I'm totally supportive of all of you. <laughs> very good point. So all those who live in Ward 6 who would like to vote, please raise your hand physically or electronically. <clears throat> And um, you know, that looks like a majority to me of the Ward Six residents who are present at this meeting. I'll stop now, Nelson, so you can I, I think that's it. Um, like I said, um, Dale and um, Chloe, welcome. Um, and if you're available, um, we'd like to get you started straight away. So we'll have a, uh, our first planning meeting for the April meeting will happen in about two weeks and um, we'll be in touch. So thank you. All right. And I think we're on time for the 
next uh, agenda item. You want to take it away, Michelle? Yes, perfect timing. That's wonderful. Um, okay, I just want to thank everyone who's joined us this evening for being here. And the next um, topic that we are addressing is a discussion about the search and the appointment of the Burlington police chief. And we have um, a panel here who will talk on this issue. And um, what I've asked each of the participants to do is to comment on the process for the selection of the police chief, and then to um, let us know uh, their perspective on the mayor's selection of a permanent acting chief, and if there's any expectation for further developments in that appointment. So what we'll do is um, I will, I think for ease, I will just, um, in, I will um, let folks know who we have participating on this panel. We have Stephanie Seguino. She's a police commissioner. She lives in Ward 6. She's co-chair of the commission currently. Um, we have Susie Comerford. Susie is a police commissioner. She lives in Ward 5. We have Karen Paul, our re-elected city councilor from Ward 6. Congratulations, Karen. And we have Joan Shannon, who is the South District City Councilor um, for, yeah, our South District City Councilor. Uh, and that South District includes Ward 6. So, um, oh, and then Jordan. Jordan, I'm so sorry. Um, Jordan joined us um, today. She uh, announced her participation. Jordan, thank you so much for coming. And, um, Maybe I'll just introduce myself. Um, my name is Jordan Riddell. I'm the mayor's chief of staff. Great, thank you. And Jordan, I was going to read the statement um, that you provided um, in lieu of the mayor or a representative participating. But since you're here, what I'm going to do is ask you to start us off. Um, and what we're going to do is we're gonna give each person five minutes to uh, address the points that I um, described initially. And then we're going to use the remainder of the time to allow our participants to ask questions or make comments. And just a heads up, um, our final presentation for this evening has been unscheduled. So depending on how this discussion goes, we may have up to 10 additional minutes. So um, we'll start with the five minutes for each presenter, go to questions and comments and just take it from there. So um, I just need to get my timer ready and um, I am gonna be a bit pesky about keeping to the time to make sure that everybody has equal time to comment. So- Michelle, can I just ask a question? Sure. Um, I know that there are a lot of attendees and I didn't know if they had been invited to join. There's a lot of, of people that are here, so. So our meeting is open to anyone in Burlington, but we do take comments first from Ward 6 residents. They get, they get priority for comments and questions, but we do, our meetings are open to any, um, Actually, our meetings are open to anyone. Well, there are people in the attendees group who are not um, panelists. That's all I'm saying. Oh, Michelle, sorry. Michelle, there are Ward Six residents that are in that are in at listed as attendees. If you, um, there's a number of them. I there's also we, Ward Five residents that are panelists. So, I think I we didn't tried know. to promote everybody to panelists. I think that's generally the goal, yeah, and okay. some folks um, yeah. choose not to be. Oh, um, but we can try okay. promoting everyone again, just to double check. I just sent a request to everyone who's there. Um, Great, thank you. Great. Sorry, Joan, I misunderstood your question. Okay, so Jordan, I will invite you to begin making your comments. You're muted. <laughs> Great. Okay, thanks, Michelle. Um, 
So hi, everybody. My name is Jordan Riddell. I'm the mayor's chief of staff. I'm a, also a Ward 5 resident. Um, uh, and I thought I would start by um, sharing a little bit procedurally how the search process worked um, and some background on the process. Uh, so over the past 10 years, the mayor, Mayor Weinberger has made over 30 appointments to senior administration positions and attracting and hiring strong leaders for the city is really a priority um, of the administration. So we put a lot of care and effort into our hiring processes. And I've been part of the mayor's office for nearly seven years. And um, in that time, I've led several search processes. And I can say really with confidence that I don't think we put more effort and energy towards a search process in that time. Um, the police chief appointment process began in the spring of 2021. And we began with a pretty extensive public engagement effort. And that included listening sessions. Um, Stephanie Seguino uh, joined us on the listening sessions. Car Counselor Paul also joined many of the listening sessions. Um, and then other, uh, Jane Stromberg, another city councilor, and Mila Grant, who was also participating on the search committee, joined for many of the listening sessions. And we also um, conducted a citywide survey. Um, following that public engagement process, we consolidated all of the input we've received. Um, and worked with the police commissioners and counselors who joined um, those listening sessions to develop an ideal candidate profile. And that profile listed um, the key attributes that um, the community was seeking in the next police chief. And I'm not gonna go through that ideal candidate profile because I only have five minutes, but um, I'm happy to talk about it more if folks have questions about it. Um, so that we posted the police chief position on August 19th and the full search committee was convened um, later in August. The stated goal of the committee was to conduct a first round of interviews and recommend, a final, recommend finalist candidates to the mayor. And usually there are between three and five finalist candidates. Um, so the position was posted on August 19th in mid to late September, it was clear that our candidate pool was small and our, our pool of qualified candidates was smaller than we hoped it would be. Um, so we consulted with two police executive search firms um, to ask for their guidance on why our pool was smaller than we hoped it would be. And they indicated that our salary band was low in comparison to um, similar cities. Uh, the Police Executive Research Forum conducted a salary survey, and they recommended a salary band of $130,000 to $160,000. Our current um, salary band is, I, I didn't write that in my notes, but I think it's one hundred and eighteen dollars to one hundred and thirty, dollars maybe. Um, so the search committee unanimously recommended that the council increase the police chief salary. Uh, the mayor and I discussed increasing the salary with counselors and it seemed like there really wasn't agreement to change the salary in September and the counselors um, we spoke with requested we re-advertise the position instead. So we did re-advertise the position, but it's important to keep in mind that at that time we did have viable candidates. Um, while it was a smaller pool, we did have viable candidates. And anyone who's been involved in a search process uh, knows that if a search process drags on too long, you can risk losing strong candidates. Jordan, and in this just one, you have one more minute, just heads up. Okay. In this specific case, we had a strong internal candidate and it was extending the process and definitely was not fair to him. Um, so the re-advertising process did not yield um, additional candidates. Um, I have some more notes here. I'm not gonna, I'm just gonna um, skip down and say overall, the city really needed permanent police leadership and the mayor didn't wanna continue dragging on the process and um, especially because the recruit uh, recruitment efforts were destined to fail because the council didn't support um, several of the steps the mayor recommended that we would need to take in order to create a supportive environment for policing and recruit a broader pool of candidates. Um, 
And so that is a perfect place to stop. Thank you so much. And Jordan, just keep those notes handy in case there's time at the end for you to go back, okay? Okay, thanks so much. Great, thank you. Okay, so Stephanie, you're next on my list. Would you please go ahead? Yeah, I was initially in, uh, invited to be on the search committee, but because it was delayed, I, I was away. And uh, so Susie Comerford, uh, as a commissioner, replaced me. I probably have some comments, but I'd like to defer to her to speak. And I, I can wrap up after the uh, Karen and Shannon have spoken as well. Joan and Shannon have spoken. I'm muted. Okay, so Susie, would you please go ahead? You're muted as well. We have a muted problem. Great. I just want to start with just so a few things about me because I know very few of you. So I'm a social work faculty at UVM for 23 years, live in the South End. My teaching and research areas are racism and other disenfranchised populations people with disabilities and refugees. And for those reasons, because the city's been struggling with these issues, um, I said yes when I was asked. So um, I came into the search process late. I've been on many search committees at UVM and currently I'm on one. Um, I can just gonna tell you what I observed. I don't want this to turn into like a big argument. We're here to learn and kind of move the whole process together. First, communications for meetings were frequently late and that made it difficult for people who did not work in the city to get there. Um, we didn't manage to set a schedule for meetings in advance so people could plan. Um, we really didn't have any role as a search committee in designing the questions to be asked despite promises that would happen. I think there was a lack of clarity among the role of the committee. Um, the search really happened in the mayor's office. Largely, they made the decisions on the questions and other key decisions. And that's different than a search committee really would happen at UVM, which I'm, I'm quite familiar with. Um, I often experience confusion as to what was happening and who was doing what and why. Um, I wondered if we were really a citizen team that a group of members whose input was sought and listened to. There was so much political noise in the background going on um, that it, it was very unwieldy. Um, I think there's a general lack of communication with the search committee um, at large. Um, and we didn't have a set of shared expectations. Um, among the search committee themselves, nor the committee, in, I think, in the mayor's office. Um, the, this is the most important part. The majority of the committee did not think the pool was deep enough and did not want the search closed. To come, when we talk about having a small pool, we had a very small pool. Only two people met the basic qualifications. And of the two people, one other person was dismissed because he had some issues in his background that didn't you know, portray a good future. So we ended up really with only one real candidate. Um, and I know the mayor asked for more money um, and for the search, um, for a search firm, and also more money for the police chief to be more competitive. And that looked like from the outside, like a real political battle. Um, so that's a little bit, my conclusions are that I deeply believe given my own background and my research areas, we're at a community inflection point. We're either gonna be a whole community where everyone is valued, respected and listened to, or we will not. This is a, there is a strong and persistent sentiment among many in the communities of color here that are concerned about the practices condoned by the present police chief towards people of color. And many white people feel the same way. I also wanna acknowledge that not every person of color holds this sentiment. Um, we as a community either listen or we don't. But if we don't, we're continuing the same white racism that has continuously existed in our country, um, our state and our city. And finally, there's there is no one in the police department um, that people who are not in the police department don't suffer from in terms of racism. I, my personal understanding is that we are brought up in a country where white supremacy was the norm from the inception. And we're still trying to, we have to recover from that so that people of color can actually live their lives unencumbered. So that's basically what I wanna say. Thank you, Susie. I appreciate your comments. And Stephanie, you want to go after the, our counselors or did you want to go after Susie? After the counselors is fine. Okay. All right. Great. So Karen. I do know how to unmute myself. Um, uh, so I have been, um, 
I've sort of lost track. I think I've been probably on six or seven search committees um, as a city councilor. I've done other search committee work in different and other organizations, but I think it's been six or seven that I have done. And these are for the hiring of department heads over the years I've been on the council. Um, I would say without question that this has been the most, this was without a doubt, the most challenging search committee that I have ever served on. Um, I think it was challenged because uh, for reason, some reasons that were beyond our control, um, we were trying to do a search without us all being in the same room, without us all having the opportunity to interact with each other as a committee. And I think that is really, really difficult. Um, Zoom is just not a replacement. Um, and I think there, and, and I think part of the reason why there was this lack of communication was because, um, because of that and because I think there was a very broad group of people that made up the committee, um, which oftentimes that's, that's what it, it is oftentimes, but I think this was a much broader group. And I think there were a lot of people that were there communicating, but not really listening to one another. Um, and that breakdown when people don't feel like they're being listened to um, does not help the, uh, the work of the committee. Um, I think we were challenged due to the salary. Um, as Jordan can confirm to you, I, I had actually given her the names of a couple of search firms and to the administration's credit, they spent the time to look into uh, these search committees. And without a doubt, I think that we needed a higher salary. Um, and Susie is right, that became a challenge. Um, and I think the reason that that is a challenge goes to the heart of what we are seeing, we are seeing in our city, we are seeing in our city council, um, is that we, there is a lack of trust and understanding that of taking each other's, taking each other at our best, at our best, and not taking each other at any sort of preconceived uh, motives. Um, but needless to say, those were the issues and the challenges that I think we had. Um, and, you know, as the, as the eternal optimist, I do believe that we can find a path forward. I think that one of the things that we learned in the appointment process is that there are clear challenges um, and clear uh, hurdles that need to be overcome if we are to move forward with the chief that we, that we currently have in the acting role. We know what those challenges are and we have to work to address them. And if we can address them, then perhaps there is a path forward um, and hopefully soon, because I think we all want the same thing. And that is you know, leadership at the police station and transformative policing um, as we move forward. So that's that, I think that's what I'll say in under five minutes. Yes, you were way under five minutes. Thank you very much, Karen. And I just want to say to the folks who have joined us who are on the next panel about the Ethan Allen Express, I just want to let you know that we actually gained some time for our presentations, these two panels, because we had our final presentation um, reschedule. So we have a little extra time. So your start time might be delayed a little bit, depending on how this discussion goes. So please sit tight. It might be a, little, a few extra minutes that we spend, but we'll spend more on you as well. Um, so Joan, please chime in. Thank you, Michelle. I was not on the search committee. And so I think that what you have heard from those who were on the search committee is more accurate than anything I could contribute to that. But just I'll just speak a little bit to historically um, what we've done for police committee, um, police chief search searches. And you know, it's a mayoral appointment, um, but it's a really important position. And I think that's long been recognized, and there has been probably more process around hiring a police chief than there has been for a lot of other department uh, department heads. Um, you know, going back to the 1980s, we had Chief Scully for quite a long time, and I um, 
I don't really, I, I think Chief Scully was, was appointed when commissions were still appointing the, um, the chiefs. And so that's probably how he got appointed. Um, going in after Chief Scully in the 1990s, uh, we hired Elena Ennis. And that was a national search and it, it yielded um, two finalist candidates and Elena Ennis was was chosen out of those two after you know public forums and and some engagement process um after Elena Ennis um there was not a national search uh when uh, they identified two candidates um inside the police department which were Steve Work and Tom Tremblay um the commission was very involved in that search and there were public forums and Tom Tremblay was selected by the the mayor at that time and then after Tom Tremblay there were uh three candidates in the next pool of candidates that were considered they were Mike Sherling Walt oh what was his name I'm forgetting uh but it was Walt and Emmett there were three all internal candidates again no national search um and they went through a very rigorous um, engagement process with, I think there were three very large panels um, that uh, evaluated the, the three of them. Um, and then uh, more recently, Brandon Del Pozo, I think that, that was again a national search and that yielded many more candidates. Um, I think, I don't know if there were six or eight candidates that got interviewed in that process. But, you know, getting to where we are today, we're just not, we're not in a great position. Um, hiring in police departments nationwide is difficult and a lot more difficult in Burlington. So I guess I was happy that we were able to attract um two qualified candidates and i guess one was eliminated along the way but um i was really worried that that we wouldn't be able to attract anybody to um this job and i i'm very concerned about the situation the department is in today and it's you know it's a difficult situation so i respect the experiences of um you know both uh, Susie and Karen, who served on that committee, um, I'm grateful that that they stepped up for that, um, and I'll leave it at that. Great, thank you, Joan. Stephanie, thanks. Uh, I I too have um, served on a lot of search committees. I was associate dean at UVM for a while and chair of the department, and so I've done this in numerous capacities. I think what was different about this search was the degree to which it was micromanaged and that the search committee didn't have the autonomy to review applications, all of the applications and uh, develop questions and so on and so forth. Uh, so that was very different than any search I've ever seen. I, uh, I think given the issues of trust, that was unfortunate that, that having the benefit of input of a wide variety of the search committee would have been really helpful to improve trust in the process and in the outcome of that. Uh, the other thing I would say is that in this environment, uh, the use of a search firm would have been very helpful. It was unfortunate that that city council resolution was not adopted, uh, that was not um, acted on because in this environment, as Joan has said, searches are uh, challenging. But Burlington has a lot to offer. And I think as a reform-minded community, we would have been able to attract a reform-minded police chief candidate had we had the ability to network more broadly. It's a very time-intensive process and search firms are really good at this. Uh, so I think that it's beneficial. I, I appreciate Susie's point that I, I don't think this ought to be a contentious discussion, but I think we can learn from this about how to do this better in the future. And given that many departments are searching for chiefs and searching for reform-minded chiefs, we needed the extra help to be able to network more deeply 
to uh, attract a larger pool of candidates. And it would have been helpful for the search committee to have the ability to look at all of the applications. I'll leave it there. Michelle, if I'd love to be able to respond to um, what Commissioner Sweeno just said, because it's just confusing for me. The search committee did receive all the applications. Uh, Jordan, just to do that, I'm going to give you a minute because I want to make sure that anyone who's participating has a who has a question or comment can give that. So I'll give you a minute to respond. And then okay, we'll yeah, there are just two things that um, in Commissioner Seguino's and Commissioner Comerford's comments that um, were a little confusing to me, just that the search committee didn't wasn't able to review all the applications. We did send all of the applications to the search committee. Um, so that didn't quite make sense to me. And then with respect to developing questions, um, that's the search committee absolutely would have been able to um, develop questions. Unfortunately, we never got to that point because we didn't um, ever schedule, we scheduled interviews and then canceled them um, because the search committee didn't feel comfortable moving forward the, with those two candidates. So if we had ever gotten to the stage where we had conducted interviews, absolutely we would have engaged the search committee in developing questions. Um, we just, we didn't get to that stage, unfortunately. Okay, thank you, Jordan. Um, so is there anyone, uh, a non-panelist, who has a question for any of the panelists or a comment that you'd like to share with them? I see Rob Backus and Amanda Skihan. So we'll go in that order. So. I was disturbed to hear about the issue with salary because when Alana Ennis came in about 22 years ago, her salary, I think, was $86,000, which created quite a stir. Since then, inflation just about doubles that. So it sounds like we're nowhere near maintaining inflation. And, you know, I could be wrong on the inflation by a little bit, but I think that's reasonably accurate. The other issue that I have that's a question I have is I don't understand where the mayor has authority to appoint an acting um, police chief to serve indefinitely. The charter gives the mayor the authority to appoint a police chief annually with approval of the city council or to fill a vacancy with approval of the city council. He's acted to fill a vacancy, but the city council hasn't improved, hasn't approved it. So I just wonder how the appointment's legal. And if it's not legal, we don't have a legal police chief, which means the police chief can't describe, can't um, discharge all the duties that he has under the Vermont statutes. So I'm 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 concerned about that. It, it 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 maybe there's something somewhere in the charter or in the ordinances, but I couldn't find it. Thank you for the question. Um, is there a panelist who'd like to respond to that? And I'd like to um, give you each one minute to respond to that. And I'm going to say Joan, and then Jordan, and then Susie. Um, thank you. Well, I am not the legal expert that Rob is. I'll start with that. But um, I just wanted to reference, you know, a, a similar but in some ways opposite um, historic data point, which is back when Bernie became mayor, he wanted to um, he, he wanted his own department heads and couldn't get them past the council. And so I believe he was stuck with department heads he didn't appoint until he got a new council and could get the um, get the department heads that he wanted appointed that they continued to serve. And there was something um, in the charter about continuing to serve until somebody else was appointed. Acting chief is a little bit different. So I'll... Um, defer to Jordan, who probably has, has a better answer than I have. Great. Thanks, Jordan. Uh, thanks, Joan. And then Jordan, please go ahead. Just pulled up my city charter, but I wasn't able to um, 
find the specific section I'm meaning to reference in the period while Joan was speaking. Um, however, uh, the what we've discussed with our city attorney is that the mayor's authority to appoint acting leadership of the police department or any department for that matter falls under his responsibility for day-to-day -day, um, management oversight of the city. Um, we have to have um, management and oversight of our police department. Um, it's this mayor's responsibility to do that. Um, and uh, we've interpreted that appointing an acting chief falls within that um, responsibility. Thanks, Jordan. And Susie. Um, I'll let Susie comment and then Rob, you can have a quick follow up comment and then we'll go to Amanda. You can give it back to Rob. My question has been answered. Oh, okay. Rob. I mean, I think it, even if the charter doesn't authorize it, which I think it might not, obviously acting officers make sense. Although it seems to me it'd be better practice to have that spelled out in the charter with definitions and terms. But the mayor isn't appointing an acting uh, police chief. He's appointing a permanent police chief. I, I frankly don't see how it's legal. And, and in your explanation, I don't think at all addresses my concerns. You're certainly entitled to disagree. I, um, I, uh, the mayor's made clear that he's asked Chief Murad to continue serving as chief um, indefinitely, we don't intend to do another search. Um, and I, I hope that um, for at least part of this conversation, we can talk about um, moving forward on some of our public safety challenges and how we work with our current police leadership to advance some of the police transformation goals that have been, that were laid out in our ideal candidate profile and um, through other community discussions. Thanks, Jordan. I want to make sure that we hear from Amanda. Hi, thanks, Michelle. So um, I want to thank you all for, for giving us the opportunity to, to interface with you tonight. Um, I've, I've been watching, obviously, city council meetings and participating for a couple of years now. I've also been watching police commission meetings. And I'm... Um, I think that we can do a better job of, of working together. I know that there were some criticisms of um, acting chief Murad's interactions with police commissioners. Having watched those meetings, I have to say, and this also goes for the city council, um, that it is clear that there, there are at times, uh, there's a breach of decorum and, and I, I hate that word decorum, but just kindness, kindness both ways, where there, there's an opportunity to work together. And I think if you listen sometimes, yes, there are always going to be differences, whether with the city council or with the police commission meetings, but there's so much that we all share to, together in, in interests and progressive goals. And that's including acting chief Murad. So with the reality right now that this, this search is not going forward, I'd love to hear about how the police commissioners are, are looking to, to go forward and work with Chief Murad, um, or, or if uh, Ms. Riddell has any information about how the, the city will support Chief Murad in going forward to, to bridge these gaps, because this has been a painful, this has been a painful time um, and, and there's some healing to do, you're gonna have to work together. And you are working together, I believe, towards restorative justice, towards uh, mental health response. So can we focus on that? And what are your goals in, in healing those relationships? Thank you, Amanda. Um, in the time we have left, I wanna make sure that we hear from Dale and then I'm just going to gauge our time to, in terms of responses to your question, Amanda. And um, I would imagine that each of those panelists that you're interested in hearing from would talk to you offline about your point. So Dale, if you could chime in. 
you know, Michelle, I just wanted to say that that really my question was very much the same as Amanda's, which is to to all of the panelists, um, how they think we're moving forward from here. So I think any of the panelists who who wanted to respond to Amanda, that's really what I was looking for as well. Okay, and just to let our panelists for the uh, railroad know, we are going to just extend this time five more minutes. I'm sorry to keep you on pause. We have five minutes, so I would like to give each of the panelists one minute to respond to Amanda and Dale's points. And let's just go in the same order. So um, Stephanie, why don't you start? Sure. You know, the role of the commission is really to provide civilian oversight, regardless of who the chief is. Uh, and that is something we've been doing. And I, I would say what we've really done in the last year is institution building. We've developed um, better mechanisms for oversight. We, uh, we were given uh, outside legal counsel to help us provide independent review of complaints, for example. We have done a lot of training. We have um, addressed the issue of racial disparities in policing, especially in the use of force. Uh, and we have been, I would argue, very collaborative uh, with the chief and with the department. Uh, you may recall that we as a commission recommended an increase in the number of officers. We recommended to the city council to host the mental health summit. I think one of the strongest things that we have done is to identify for the community that many of the calls for service are actually related to social distress, whether that is mental health or whether it is opioid addiction. And we have been uh, pushing for uh, some changes that would help uh, address that, including uh, additional community service liaisons and so forth. Uh, that okay, is I'm going to have to ask you to very okay. quickly wrap it up. Okay. That is fine. That's good. Okay, good. Thank you. Okay, uh, Susie, one minute. Just one quick comment. I've heard over and over tonight the word we, and I'm looking around the room and we are not all here. And the, the part of the we that's not here have been having continuous issues. And that's not an easy thing to talk about among our neighbors, among our friends, or at the police commission. But we have a, a large community here and we're not all the same. We have to address the question of who belongs within the we. Thank you, Susie. Okay. And Karen. Uh, well, the first thing I wanted to say is I do want to second what uh, Stephanie had said earlier. I, when, uh, 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 when the police chief was hired, when Tom Tremblay was hired, I was on the police commission at that time. And um, I can say that the police commission of even, that was a long time ago. Um, the police commission of today is not the police commission of two years ago five years ago or any time before that, there has been tremendous change in the police commission and it is for the better. Uh, this is a group of people that work well together. They're collaborative with, it, with one another and they are really working. The amount of time that they put in is, if people knew, it's unbelievable the amount of time that they put into this endeavor. Um, at the same time, you know, you are, you are right, Amanda, we all have to, we have to get beyond whatever challenges there are. I think that they are not insurmountable, but we can't do it without having everyone in the room and we can't have it without everybody being respectful. And sometimes, you know, sometimes it's not just what you say, but how you say it. Um, sometimes it's not always seen by the public, but there are challenges. And until those challenges are openly acknowledged by everyone, including the people that are the challengers, um, you know, we, we have to keep on working on that. Um, Thank you, Karen. I, I hate to cut you off, but okay. Okay. Thanks. And then Jordan, why don't you bring us home? You've got a minute. Um, I, I feel like the comments others have made have been um, well said. Um, I maybe would just end by saying that I think we're very fortunate to have Chief Murad serving as our chief. He's um, exceptionally qualified for the role. 
and um, I could list some of the things that he's um, done in his time with the Burlington Police Department, but um, we have limited time um, to do that. I, uh, as I said earlier, I do really encourage us as a community to uh, move forward on these public safety challenges that, uh, at least from the mayor's office, we've been hearing from Ward 6 residents about, and this is also an opportunity to work with Chief Mirad to advance those police transformation goals. And um, I look forward to uh, continuing to do that work. And I know the mayor does as well. Great, thank you so much. I wanna thank each of you for the panelists for participating and modeling. I think I get, I get one oh, more God, comment. I'm so sorry. How did it's I- It's okay, Michelle. I'm so sorry. Ah. I go unnoticed, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you got a quick minute. Um, I, I just want to say I appreciate Amanda's question, and we often forget that we are all on the same team, and for whatever divides us, there's a lot more that unites us, and um, basically, I think we're all, we all want to go in the same direction, but we very much disagree on the route to get there, and um, I am just cognizant of how fortunate we are to have Chief Murad, and I'm grateful that he's been con willing to continue to serve our community, and I honestly don't know what we would do without him, so it's important to me um, to protect that relationship, to support him, and um, to stabilize the police department, to me, is the top priority. And once we do that, we can start building towards other goals, but stabilization to me is what needs to come first. And I think I support um, the goals no, that, no, gonna, that we all share. I unfortunately have to ask you to stop right there. Okay, thank you very, very much. And as I was saying, thank you to each of the panelists. You've modeled respectful, honest discussion from a variety of standpoints and I think it's been useful for us to hear from each of you. Thank you very much. Um, we're just gonna make a quick segue here to our next presentation. It's a panel on the Amtrak Ethan Allen Express. And what we will hear from our panelists is the, a bit of a, the background from their, each of their perspectives, meaning their participation in the development of this new rail service that's coming to Burlington and the current status of the project from their perspectives and also their expectations of this service for Burlingtonians. And we're going to do a similar format to what you've just seen. What we'll do is give five minutes to each of the presenters to, um, give that overview I just described, and then we'll take uh, the remaining time to hear from our participants, their questions and comments, and then um, make sure that we have, our panelists will have time to um, respond to those questions and comments if needed or asked. And then I just want these panelists to know we've earned ourselves about 10 minutes of extra time due to the um, elimination of our final presentation. So um, that's enough about that. And what I'd like to do is just uh, go in the order that um, we have in front of me that the panelists have been provided with. So that brings us to Melinda Moulton who will, um, answer the points that I described. And um, Oiso, I will um, ask the two of you combined if you can keep it um, like to about eight minutes, that would be great. Here you go. Okay, um, hi folks. Uh, great to see a lot of you on my screen. Uh, I, want, I do wanna recognize Oiso Makuku who was the incoming CEO for Main Street Landing. So I have to start with that because um, it's just a wonderful thing. And so how we decided to do this is I'm gonna give you the history 
and give you my four minutes or whatever. And then I'm going to turn it over to Luizo to talk a little bit about the future because that's kind of how we are. I'm kind of like the past and she's the, and she's the present. Hey, Melinda, I just realized I didn't identify you. So if you don't uh, have to, it's if just, panelists just provide us with your. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm, well, I'm, I'm, I am the, I am uh, the 40 years. I've been the CEO of Main Street Landing. Uh, my, I'll tell you my experience with, with rail is I got a call from Howard Dean when he was governor and he said, hey, we want to create a train station at Main Street Landing. And I said, okay. I said, that's great. Um, let's, let's figure it out. So he secured federal and it's probably some state dollars. And we uh, signed a lease with the state of Vermont, a 20 year lease. And we built the train station. And uh, while we built, we're building the train station, I'm just gonna tell you a little aside. I got a call from Howard Dean and he said, by the way, uh, Tom Brokoff and his CBS crew are coming, his NBC crew are coming up to Burlington and they are identifying you and me as the fleecers of America. And I don't know if you all remember the, the show, The Fleecing of America, Tom Brokaw, National News. Well, I, what was I? I was like, you know, in my late forties or something. And here I'm gonna be a fleecer of America uh, you know, on national news. And so in comes the crew and uh, they taped us and it was on the national news. So anyway, I just wanna let you know that because of the $1.5 million that we secured for this train uh, station, my uh, five seconds of fame were as a fleecer of America. So there's that story. Um, it, I, I have, I mean, Main Street Landing has been just dying to have, have passenger rail return to Burlington. And um, I cannot tell you how thrilled I am that we are at this, at this crossroads uh, in time, uh, but it's been a long road. And we built the train station. We had the commuter rail come in for a little bit for a couple of years to mitigate uh, the construction on Route 7. And then that commuter rail stopped. Uh, we had, um, we had uh, me, myself, and Irene, a film crew from Hollywood uh, with Jim Carrey and Renee Zellweger. I don't know if Chapin, if you remember this, but they came in and they shot a film and used the station as one of the locations. And I was sitting in my up in the pat up in the patio outside my office, and I was like, "Oh my God, it's an Amtrak!" And this was for the shooting of the film, so they only stayed for a few days. But anyway, I have been Macy Landing, and all of us have been waiting forever for this. And I want to give a huge shout out to uh, Vermont Railway and um, and to the state of, of Vermont for the work that they've done, the construction that's gone on uh, in front of the Union Station has been extraordinary. It's been uh, beautifully done. I think it's classy. Uh, I'm, I'm just really thrilled, Chape, and I wanna give a shout out to you as well for all your work on this as well. Um, but this has been a historical moment. And for 30 years, I've been sitting around waiting for the train and, um, and that's pretty much the history of it. It's been an empty train station. We sold the station to the state of Vermont. I think Dan's on the call here, Dan Delabru. Uh, about two years ago, we, we sold it as part of our condominium to the state of Vermont. So they own it. And uh, they're gonna be operating out of that, out of that location. Um, and uh, I, I wanna see the train go to Montreal. I'm gonna let Oizo uh, talk a little bit about this, but just for all of you um, on this call, this is momentous. And um, this is really a huge moment for our state and for Burlington. And, um, and I think we all should be really proud of, of all the stakeholders, the, the hundreds of people who have worked really hard to, to have this moment in history happen for our, our, our town. I mean, I, I projected 30 years ago that we would see a thousand people come into Burlington by rail. And I'm sure it could be a thousand right off the bat, but I promise you, as this train grows and as we as we move along that track up north, I, I can see someday having a having a thousand people arrive in Burlington. So um, so that I, that's that's the story. That's my history um, as a fleecer of America. Thank you for listening, and I'm going to turn it over to Aweezo. Um, and Aweezo, why don't you share a little bit about the vision for the future and what you're seeing here? Thank you. Hi everyone. I don't have as much history as Melinda has on the waterfront, although. Um... I met her 20 years ago when I was the waterfront coordinator for Burlington. So there's that. Um, I'm actually really excited about, um, about Amtrak coming through as well. I mean, the, the fact that it's going to be this, we're going to be this 
the hub between New York City and eventually Montreal is huge for Burlington. Um, it will give us so much access and exposure. It'll, it'll create connectivity that we didn't have before, connections to cultural centers. Um, it's a sustainable transportation option. So there'll be fewer cars on the road and we can emphasize um, bike share and walking and um, car share and college street shuttle and everything else. And um, it's just such an opportunity for Main Street Landing to be one of the hosts, I believe, of Amtrak and, um, and to work with, um, with, with Katma and other organizations to strengthen um, mobility options once people get to Burlington. And, um, you know, I just, I see doing a, a lot to, um, I see Main Street Landing being a welcomer, being a host, being, um, being part of the future of, of rail in, um, in Burlington, giving people more of a reason to, um, to want to come to this important gateway. And I'll cut off my comments there because everyone else has a lot of interesting things to tell you about the history. Great. Thank you, Aliso. Um, I just want to say that we're going to hear from each of our panelists, then we're going to open this up for questions. So please hold on to your questions and we'll make sure that we hear from you. Okay, so um, we have Selden Houghton with us. Selden, why, you, why don't you introduce yourself and um, make your remarks? Yes, uh, Selden Houghton, uh, President of Vermont Rail System. And uh, yeah, thanks for the invitation to uh, you know answer some questions and highlight some of the work that's been happening. Uh, certainly, uh, want to recognize the, very much the team effort that's in, been involved here, uh, the collaboration with VTrans, the city, Vermont Rail System, the community, um, and, and certainly uh, we're excited as well to see Amtrak uh, come into Burlington. So. Uh, our role here is the host railroad, and um, so you know, then I'm going to interrupt you just to say that you're representing representing Vermont Rail Systems. Correct. Yeah. Um. So yeah, our our role as the host railroad is to uh, you know, uh, host Amtrak. They come on the railroad at Whitehall, New York. They currently come into Rutland today, and um, looking forward to them continuing on to Burlington. Uh, Presently, um, you know, I, I think Melinda mentioned the work that was done at Main Street Landing. Um, the majority of that was a state project, and I'll, I'll let Dan speak a little more to that. Um, we started some of the initial efforts there in the uh, fall of 2020 to get the, the track realigned and get the prep work underway for the state project. Um, and currently, we're working in the yard south of Maple Street constructing the uh, layover in servicing track for Amtrak when it comes and getting other infrastructure in place along the corridor to support the service. Um, if folks haven't noticed, Amtrak has started uh, training their crews. There's been several qualification runs uh, that have happened and are continuing to happen. So you will see some Amtrak trains up this way. So uh, very excited. And I, I think in terms of the, the goals of the service, um, I certainly will let Dan DeLabriere speak more to that from the VTrans perspective. Great, thank you, Selden. Um, Chapin, I'm gonna ask you to chime in next. All right. Well, it seems like this may be one of our bi-weekly coordination meetings uh, between VRS and uh, the city and uh, VTrans and the community. This is historic, I agree. Melinda, momentous is an appropriate word. Uh, 30 years ago, uh, thanks to Melinda and others. Uh, there, were, there were two main goals in the waterfront that haven't yet been achieved. One was putting the bike path on the west side of the tracks, and number two was bringing passenger rail to Burlington. We've accomplished a lot on the waterfront, but for decades we could not accomplish those two. The problem was that they were inextricably intertwined, and the land was so tight and the state owned such a large piece of railroad right of way that there wasn't really a clear path forward. Now, as folks may recall, it's, it's not such distant history that two years ago, uh, three years ago, there was a pretty significant public uh, debate on where the train was going to overnight. And that debate threatened the alignment of key stakeholders to bring passenger rail back to Berlin. 
And I'm really pleased to say that the people on this call today really worked hard to find a win-win solution and that every partner has taken a little bit of blood and shared it uh, in, in, in the group effort here of achieving the group goal. Uh, the city has contributed some land. We have contributed some treasure, uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars to support the overnighting in the rail yard. And together, you know, VRS, VTrans, uh, adjacent partners who are property owners have all pitched in to make this work. And there were over 10 legal agreements that need to be brokered among partners, all of which got unanimous council approval to get to the point where we are today. And uh, I couldn't be more pleased with the sense of collaboration and problem solving. We're not done yet. We've got a couple more months of construction, Selden. I was so pleased to see the contractor working hard in the rail yard today. And uh, we at Public Works have even given up some of our land uh, at the wastewater treatment plant to be able to move over that access road to allow for the Amtrak spur to be added so that Amtrak can be stored in the rail yard and not in front of Union Station. So I got to tell you, you know, there are times when there's political battles that are not win-win and it is tough to be in a place where you're trying to win a vote where someone's going to lose. But I think this project has been the perfect example of working so hard until you can find that win-win and the fact that all the parties here are now working in alignment. This is going to happen. And my family has told me as soon as it's running, Dan, I'm taking the family to Hamilton. And uh, I'm committing that here. I see this as being recorded. So I think I'm definitely on the hook now. Yes, that's great. Thank you, Chapin. Dan, please introduce yourself and make your comments. Well, good evening, everybody. And uh, thanks for inviting me to this meeting. Um, my name is Dan Delabriere. I'm the Rail and Aviation Bureau Director for the Vermont Agency of Transportation. Uh, the Vermont Agency of Transportation uh, we manage the two train services that come into the state of Vermont, the Ethan Allen, which now terminates in Rutland. And what we're talking about is bringing that train to terminate in Burlington um, every night. The other train is our Vermonter service, which starts in St. Albans and runs all the way down to Washington, D.C. So we're, we're going to have two great trains uh, in and out of Vermont um, every single day. And we're so excited that the Ethan Allen will now come to the great city of Burlington, right downtown where it should be, you know, the, uh, the largest city in the state. So you should have train service right in your downtown. And that was uh, VTrans in Vermont's goal. Um, I will tell you that I want to echo Melinda and Chapin and Selden. This could not have been done without a team effort. I mean, there's so many items that had to be worked out, figured out, um, worked together. Um, and it's just been a, it's just been a team effort. Um, so a little history, the background of this, um, you know, the Ethan Allen's been running into Rutland since I think it was 1996, I believe was when it came in there. Um, and it was shortly after that, that people were like, well, okay, well, if it's in Rutland, why can't it go to Burlington? 2005, um, you know, Senator Jeffords got the state um, an earmark to start working on the track because the track just, it needed to be upgraded from Rutland to Burlington, wouldn't support um, passenger service on the tracks that were there. Uh, we needed new track, we needed upgraded crossings, we needed upgraded bridges, we needed um, sidings so that uh, passenger trains could bypass freight trains. Um, there's, there's so many things that, projects that had to be done. Um, and we've been, VTrans has been working on this again, since, like I said, 2005 ish. Um, I took over the project in, um, 2011 ish, and, uh, we've kind of ramped it up since then. Um, we've put in all new track, not all new, but mostly new track between Rutland and Burlington. Um, we have added. Uh, lights and gates to, I'm going to say 20 plus, almost 30 crossings between Rutland and Burlington. Um, we've added 
the uh, station platform in Middlebury. We've added the station platform in Virgens. Uh, we moved a building in Virgens to create a station in Virgens to have a station stop there. Uh, and then I'll, of course, whatever you guys, what you guys are familiar with is all the work that we're doing in Burlington. Uh, the, new, the new platform in Burlington, which is coming out great. Um, the new siding that the Amtrak train will sit on that both Selden and Chapin have uh, also mentioned already. Um, but that, that work is being uh, worked on right now. Our goal at VTrans is to have all of this work done. Um, it's right now, if you look at the construction schedules, uh, they all work out to be sometime in June. So uh, we are anticipating starting Amtrak service sometime in July of this year. Um, and again, it's just so exciting. We're gonna be able to get on the train in downtown Burlington, ride it all the way to New York Penn, spend the weekend in New York and come right back. So um, while we don't have an exact schedule, uh, I will tell you that the approximate schedule is leaving Burlington somewhere around 10-ish in the morning. Don't hold me to the exact time because we don't, we don't have it yet. We don't have a timetable yet, but somewhere around 10-ish in the morning um it'll it'll arrive in uh new york Penn a little before six at night so around 5 45 ish um and then on a daily basis it'll leave new york Penn around 2 20 ish in the afternoon and arrive just before 10 p.m back in burlington at night so that's the approximate schedule um again not the finalized schedule so don't hold me to that exactly but that's about where we are right now that's what we know today um and i think i could go on for about an hour on this stuff but i'll, I'll stop there and um i will look for questions great thank you so much boy i have a list myself but i'm gonna give priority to other folks participating nancy do you have a question about the rail about the Amtrak coming to Burlington, your hand's been up since the beginning. Nancy Harkins. There you are. Sorry, that was a mistake. I, I, sorry, I have to get my hand down. Okay. All right. So another call for questions. Uh, Amy Mellencamp has a question, has her hand up. Oh, great. Amy, and then Rodney. Well, I don't really have a question, but, um, but I just want to applaud everybody for all the work that's happening, happened. I've been so excited about this project, and I just want to know how I can be on the first run to New York City. Can I claim a ticket right now? I have a lot. I have a lot of people ask me that question. Can I be on the first train? Uh, I think I'm going to need an extra ten cars for the first train. <laughs> I'll fight you for it, Amy. Okay, we'll do. We'll go together. <laughs> there you go. You can sit on my lap. Okay. <laughs> there you go. Now, thank okay. you, everybody, for all your work. That's a, it's a vote of appreciation for you all. Thanks, Rodney. Uh, thank you all. Um, I, I, I'd like to be on that first train too. Um, I'm sure there's a lot of good. It, you'll need those ten extra cars or more. Um, I, I'm just curious as to what what work remains to be done. What what's unfinished? I I walk down onto Perkins Pier with the dog every evening. So and I'm and you know so I've been watching a lot of the the stuff that's going on down there. So I'm curious what what remains to be done to to sort of complete the the infrastructure, if you will. Yeah, sure. So, um, so in Burlington, we have the platform, which is not complete. We still have the um, canopy to put up. We've got some lighting to do, some other minor adjustments. Uh, we've got some work to do in King Street and Maple Street still. Um, the Amtrak overnight siding that Selden was discussing earlier and Chapin was talking about, um, that's being built right now. Now to build that siding, it required a whole bunch of other tracks that were um, sort of in the same spot. Where it's kind of, we had to slide a bunch of tracks over. So there's a whole bunch of re reconfiguration of tracks in the yard right now that um, you have to have a 
you have to have a, an exact layout for these tracks. Otherwise, mm -hmm. trains, cars, and locomotives can't align on the tracks, right? So you, it's very precise as far as getting those tracks in the right spot. So um, working on that right now. Uh, south of Burlington, we have um, a tiny bit of le work left at the Middlebury Station where we've got some parking uh, yet to finish up there. Um, down in Pittsford, um, there's an, a bypass siding there near the Amia uh, plant where uh, passenger trains will bypass freight trains there on the siding. Uh, and then there's a few spots along the line um, kind of north of uh, Virgins to Burlington where there's a couple, there's several spots where we have to do what we call injections into the ground where um, uh, it's just going to stabilize the ballast and things like that. So those are the major things left. Um, there's some signalization still yet to be done, which um, BRS and Selden's team's working on uh, for um, actual, when I say signalization, I'm talking about train signals, not, not signals at road crossings. These are actually um, signals that the train crew follows. So those are the things that we have left to do between now and June. And um, each one of those, and it sounds like a lot, and it is, but we seem to be on track. Um, and I'm not going to pardon the pun. I'm going to say that's exactly what I mean. We're on track um, <laughs> to get this done. Great. Right. And Michelle, can I add one thing? Sure. Which is that uh, I just want to give a shout out to the Parks and Recreation Waterfront Department in coordinating with VTRANS. And VTRANS agreed, which is amazing, to, to basically project manage the bike path project as well as the waterfront passenger rail project. What that means is that instead of having to do the waterfront rail project, finish that, and then bring in a whole separate construction project to do the waterfront bike path, which would have extended the period, extended the disruption on the waterfront. VTRANS agreed to roll the bike path project into it with a lot of oversight from parks and DPW. And what that means is that, you know, as, as Dan talked about the remaining rail work, there's a little bit of bike path work that needs to be done, but ultimately the end result for Burlingtonians will be less disruption with this unified project. And it just shows what good coordination can do. That's great. I'm Michelle, yeah, I'm Melinda here. Can I just quickly add for any of the uh, of our viewers here, if you're interested in learning more about the history of rail travel over the last several hundred years, couple hundred years in Burlington, I, I want to uh, send you to the Main Street Landing website, mainstreetlanding.com, and you click on history and you'll see a 45 minute video that we created on the history of the Burlington waterfront. And quite a bit of that show talks about the rise of rail uh, in Burlington and on the waterfront. It's a really great little piece and you'll learn a lot about the history. Great, thank you, Melinda. And we see a little piece of it um, behind Chapin. His, his uh, backdrop is showing us the path and the rails, the train tracks. Um, is there anyone else? Greg, you have a question. Yes, thanks. Uh, I'm just as eager, you know, I'm ready to climb on top of the uh, one of the cars with my chickens. Uh, <laughs> the first, there's not enough space. Uh, but my question is, I know there's no Amtrak uh, rep uh, here on the call uh, Zoom today, but um, could anyone uh, provide any information as to what's next, you know, to the Montreal connection? So I'll try to help you there. Um... So there's, there's <laughs> going north of Burlington. Uh, okay, well, let me back up. Going from Rutland to Burlington and all the complications that are involved there. Um, now take that and, um, you know, multiply it times two because now you've got another country involved. Um, so getting, one of the things we are working on separate from the Ethan Allen our first goal at VTRANS is to continue our Vermonter service, which stops in St. Albans, um, to get all the details worked out and to get that train to Montreal. That, that's, that's one of the VTRANS goals. It's, it's one of um, 
yeah, well, it's one of the administration's goals uh, that VTrans is working on. Um, so if that, ha it, I shouldn't say if, when that happens, uh, then it'll open up the discussion of whether the Ethan Allen, you know, can follow the same, can follow the same, uh, you know, all the same rules and all the same things that we did there. So step one is to get the Vermonter there. Uh, step two, then we can start talking about the Ethan Allen. Now, there's significant amount of track work sort of north of Burlington Station that would have to be done, uh, much like, you know, the track south of Burlington wasn't um, ready for Amtrak service. The track north between Burlington and Essex is not ready for passenger service. So, um, you know, it's being talked about. I don't want to say it's it's a, you know, it's a it's definitely a, a something that we're going to get done. And I don't have a timeline. Uh, I'm saying that what we are working on is getting the Vermonter there first. When you do projects like this, you got to kind of go in baby steps. You can't. You can't eat the whole apple in one bite. So you got it, you know, let's get the Vermonter there and then we can start talking about the next step. Right. Thank you, Dan. Um, I don't see any more hands, which means I want to raise my hand. Um, okay, so I have a number of questions. So, um, one is, does anyone, can anyone estimate the cost of a one-way ticket from Burlington to New York City? Yeah, I get that question a lot and I, I don't have an answer for you right now. We are literally, um, and I will tell you, I mean, yesterday, even as of yesterday, I'm still working on the contract uh, between VTrans and Amtrak. So, you know, costs, get rolled into ticket costs and that whole thing gets kind of figured out. It's all a big puzzle. So the answer is I don't have an answer right now, um, but um, you know. Can you give us still, a range? How about like a broad range? I don't even, I, I'm sorry, I don't even have that. I, we, we really haven't gotten to ticket costs yet. We, we're just not there yet. We're, we're, we're on, we're really on actual cost of train how much does a crew cost how much does fuel cost how much does you know police cost all that stuff we're still working on all that so gotcha um also, okay what is the maximum speed of this train we can go 59 miles an hour at the top speed now it's not going to be 59 every mile of the of the of the whole trip but uh top speed is 59 miles an hour great and did oh sorry if i could just this is selden if i could just jump in there while your guys are talking about speed and that was a great question as dan said it will be 59 miles an hour and that's one of the things we'll be looking to get the message out to the community with operation lifesaver along the entire length of this corridor that hasn't seen passenger service since the 50s and and the education in all the towns and with first responders about you know our freight trains are typically doing anywhere from 25 to 40 miles an hour and now you're going to have passenger doing 59 it's a lot quieter than a freight train so really um, could use all the help we can get um, getting that message out um, that they're running qualification runs now and um, just highlight the safety aspect of things great thank you Selden. Yeah, so another question I had was, do the upgrades that you have put in place benefit the freight trains as well? Certainly we take advantage of the, you know, the tracks, um, as Dan had mentioned prior to the Amtrak were 10 and 25 mile an hour. And, you know, bringing them up to passenger speed does allow the freights to go at 40 miles an hour um, for a good chunk of the corridor, which is certainly few, far more fuel efficient um, and far more efficient moving, you know, the freight goods in and out of the state. So certainly um, advantages come, come with it, that as well. Great. And are there any amenities that we can expect like food and drinks and I don't know, a disco car? <laughs> so, um... The consist of the train will consist of um, four coach cars, which are just regular coaches, and then there will be one cafe car. So cafe car, you'll be able to um, 
you know, get a sandwich or whatever uh, on your trip down, soda, something like that. There's there's a, even a couple of, um, you know, I think Cabot cheese and things like that, Vermont products. So it's nice. Um, there's Wi-Fi on the train, we, free Wi-Fi. So if you want to take a trip down, you can have your device going the whole time. Um, you know, yeah. There, oh, bike racks. There'll be bike racks. So if you wanted to uh, load your bike on, um, you can take your bike. So. And I'm assuming there's a bathroom. Oh, yes. Yeah, restrooms in every car. Yep. Yep. And generally, how long are the stops? So what I read is that the stops between Burlington and New York City will be um, Middlebury, no, Virgen's Middlebury Castleton. Is that correct? And so the Vermont, Rutland? yeah, the Vermont, the Vermont stops, you, obviously Burlington, um, Virgen's, Middlebury, Rutland, Castleton. But then you get into New York uh, and there's uh, several stops. Fort Edwards uh, goes down through um, Saratoga Springs, Albany, you know, all through there until you get to New York Penn. Um, currently the trip, like I said, currently the trip we, today, as of today, we leave Rutland at 1220 and we're in New York at 545. So, you know, it's, it's a pretty quick trip really. Um, I don't think you could probably drive it and park your car in New York and do the whole deal. I think it's uh, going to be a, a little bit quicker on the train than it is uh, for the car. So, and can you take a trip from Burlington to Saratoga or Burlington to Rutland? Yeah. I mean, do you, so sure. you can, yeah, so you can do a trip to any one of those spots along the way. Absolutely. Great. Yeah, Saratoga is actually because uh, of the the racetrack there. That's actually kind of a big destination point for many people. Right. Um, do you anticipate that it will relieve any traffic between Middlebury and Burlington? Like any, will it be cost effective for people to hop a train from Burlington or from Middlebury to Burlington? Well, I mean, it's possible, but this is, this is, uh, you gotta remember, this is called, this is what's called an inner city passenger train. It's not a commuter train. So it wouldn't be something that most people would, you know, use on a daily basis back and forth to work. Um, but this is more of a longer range. It's called inner city passenger uh, because, it, you know, it's it's more likely that you're going to go from Burlington all the way to New York City. Um, that's right. Cool. Um, one of the things I appreciate in this discussion, we haven't spent a lot of time on it, on it, but you have highlighted it, which is all the moving parts. I mean, it makes sense when we hear from you folks who've actually had to do the work of establishing this route, just how many different pieces there are just like within agreements and the physical work of upgrading the, the infrastructure. And I mean, there's just a million parts and I don't know a fraction of it. Um, it just makes me really appreciate as we've heard expressed how you've all come together to pull this off because for a lay person like me, it's like, yeah, trained in New York City, do it. And it's so easy to say that, but when you talk about all the pieces involved, then it's like, oh my God, you did it. So thanks for sharing. Um, well, and I will tell you, Judge, I would like to make a comment that, uh, you know, Chapin mentioned it earlier. Um, we have had just an amazing team of folks working on this between, you know, Chapin's team, uh, Parks and Rec, uh, you know, Selden at VRS and his team, um, you know, Melinda, all, everybody that you're talking to today had a real big hand in um, this project and it has been complicated. Uh, we're very proud of it. I can tell you that because we've really come a long way and um, there's a lot of people that should be thanked for all their work on this project. And we can finally see the light at the end of the tunnel. <laughs> and it's not Hoboken. Oops. <laughs> um, so, uh, Greg, I see that your hand is up. We have another presentation. If you can say something in one minute, um, you can have another bite at the apple here. Sure. Okay, sure. Um, yeah. My quick question is, is that I've taken the train many, many, Ethan Allen, many, many times between Castleton, and, which is a great station, and New York City. But occasionally, and I've taken friends, and we've all complained about the quality of the cars 
the passenger cars. And I know Amtrak, uh, I think this new money that's coming in, federal money, they're going to be upgrading the Amtrak cars. Does Dan know anything about uh, when these new cars might be put into service? And if so, will they be uh, deployed on the Ethan Allen? Yeah, the, answer, the, short yeah. answer, the short answer is yes. Uh, we will be getting new equipment for both the Vermonter and the Ethan Allen. The problem I have is I don't know when. Um, Amtrak has a procurement contract out to build these. It, these aren't overnight things. You don't just go and buy these off a car lot. They have to build them. And um, they're doing this for not just Vermont. They're doing this all across the country. So, I mean, it, it literally could be years before we see this equipment because they're just not, they're not even built yet. So, but yes, we will eventually be getting all new, um, all new equipment. That's great. Um, wow, what a wonderful crew. What, it's just been so interesting and I could certainly listen to you for another hour um, or an hour more, um, but we have one more presentation and we wanna make sure that Andy and Ruby get their time. Thank you so much, Dan and Melinda and Oizo and Chapin and um, Selden. Uh, thank you so much for your time and uh, all you've done to bring this um, exciting new travel option to Burlingtonians. Thank you for arranging this, Michelle. Oh, Thank you're you. very welcome. You're very welcome. Great. So moving along, we have a presentation now by Andy Simon and Ruby Perry, and they are going to talk about Save Open Space in Burlington. Hi. Um, I'm Andy Simon. Um, we're actually going to talk about the Barge Canal is what we're going to talk about, the Pine Street Barge Canal. And we are um, part of a group called Save Open Space Burlington. Hold on, hold on. I haven't quite. Sh well, let me, I, let me, I can, do, I can do an introduction while you, while you get up the screen sharing room. Okay. okay. We live on uh, Locust Street around the corner from the Barge Canal, so we've been involved with it. And I do want to say that we have a railroad component to our presentation. So uh, railroad fans uh, will enjoy at least one part of this uh, presentation. We have a, a little bit of a presentation about an eight or nine minute presentation, and then we'd like to open it up for questions about the Barge Canal. Mm, I'm having trouble. It's not popping up. Come, uh, I'm having a little trouble sharing you're not, you're, my screen. You're not getting the screen, screen share room? No, it's it popped out of Chrome and into Firefox. Do you want to share it and? Okay. Okay. Come on. Huh? No, nope, wrong one. Okay. Yeah. And then you got to go. Yeah. Slideshow. So you want to do it? Do that part. So um, slideshow, we, um, I'll go back to the start here. There's the railroad. So uh, we hey, wanted to- I'm gonna just interrupt you for one sec. Could you just introduce you and Ruby and your role a little bit? Our role, my name is Andy Simon. Um, I uh, am among other things, a Ward 5 NPA steering committee member. So that's not the capacity that um, I am in tonight. Uh, we are, uh, Ruby and I are um, uh, residents of Burlington in Ward 5, and uh, since, um, uh, well, most actively since last November, we've been involved with um, uh, getting to know and um, advocating for conservation and remediation of the Pine Street Barge Canal under right. the banner of Save Open Space Burlington. Okay, thanks. Ruby, would you like to introduce yourself? I think that's plenty. Okay. Um, so uh, here's uh, the where the Pine Street Barge Canal is in Burlington. I'm assuming that most people in Ward 6 or people on this call know the Barge Canal. But j just to get you oriented, I think that that's, uh, it's useful to sort of know where we are. We're talking about the site that's west of Pine Street, north of um, BED, and uh, just uh, near the railroad track. 
Um, it's useful to have some history about the Pine, the Pine Street Barge Canal. This is the area around the Barge Canal pre-1850s when um, it was all wetlands, a uh, transition zone between, um, between uh, the growing city of Burlington and the lake. Uh, it's a large area you can see that, that was covered by wetlands in, in this uh, period of time. And it was a hunting ground, a gathering ground, a fishing ground for um, indigenous people uh, and early uh, Euro-American residents of, of Burlington. The railroad came in 1849, and that was a big uh, impact on this area, uh, among other things. Um, this is the Rutland and Burlington Railroad that um, uh, came in and built a track right between the, the wetlands and the lake and uh, essentially cut off the uh, access of the, of the wetlands to the lake, the connection between the two. It also uh, promoted a really rapid industrialization of, of Burlington. Um, just to get a, sort of a picture, an aerial picture uh, at the top, you see Lake Champlain and just below that, the, the railway line, uh, that's where Rutland and Burlington came in and uh, you can see the barge canal uh, right below that in this picture that's oriented uh, that way. Uh, we'll come back to this picture because it's a good one. So in uh, the second half of the 19th century, lumber, the lumber industry was the big industry in Burlington. And um, uh, the, most of the lumber after the um, Vermont forests were depleted uh, came from Quebec down the lake on sailing barges, hence the barge canal. Uh, they needed to be able to store the lumber over, uh, over the winter because the lake would freeze up. So they couldn't get the lumber in continuously. So um, Lawrence Barnes, a uh, name that you will know because of the school, uh, will, um, who was one of the big lumber barons in Burlington, decided to uh, dredge a canal into the filled area. So all of this area here was, was all filled with um, wood chips and sawdust from the lumber mills. He dredged a canal into that area from the lake, built a drawbridge down here uh, to get across the tracks and uh, created this new lumber storage area. This, you can see Howard Street coming right down into it. Um, but the lumber industry went down very quickly in the 1890s. Another industry sprang up on the barge canal. This was a manufactured gas plant. It burned coal or it brought coal, turned coal from Pennsylvania that came up on the railroad uh, into gas to use for businesses and households for lighting, heating, um, and uh, was a, this isn't a plant in Burlington, but this is a similar plant in Rhode Island. It's a dirty uh, industry. Um, the um, the uh, gas is filtered through um, uh, wood chips and um, the wood chips that were saturated with coal tar uh, were taken out back in the barge canal um, dumped in the water, dumped in the land, dumped in the old um, storage areas. Uh, and uh, that was the, the biggest source of pollution in, uh, in this barge canal area was from that manufactured gas plant. It operated from 1900 to 1966, fairly recently. So um, the um, growing consciousness in the 70s of, uh, of the environment led to the creation of the EPA and led to the legislation that created the Superfund uh, sites all over, uh, the, all over the country. And um, uh, the Barge Canal was added to the national priorities list of the Superfund legislation in um, 1983. Um, the, uh, the EPA, um, after a very long contentious uh, 
fairly contentious process in Burlington, um, uh, recorded a, a record of decision in 1998 that instead of uh, aggressively going after a remedy uh, uh, that would solve the contamination, decided to uh, cap, essentially just cap the uh, bottom of the, the canal itself and leave the, um, leave the land pretty much uh, alone with uh, uh, frequent monitoring by the EPA five, every five years. So we're going back to look at the, uh, at the land itself. In this period of time, uh, uh, since uh, 1998, well, really since the, uh, the closing down of the manufactured gas plant, uh, the trees have grown up, there's cottonwood, there's uh, red osier dogwood, there's invasive species like um, uh, buckthorn and phragmites, um, but the, the trees have repopulated uh, the area and um, lots of animals live there, beavers, herons, uh, Canada geese. I don't know if you've been down there, I've seen a, a bald eagle down there and um, uh, lots of, of different kinds of animals, fish um, and uh, smaller creatures live in the, in the barge canal. This is what the, um, turned in the other orientation, the north-south orientation, this is what the zoning looks like at the Barge Canal right now. Um, the, the middle section right here with the um, uh, um, green around it is uh, under conservation zoning. And this part right here in the middle is owned by the city. It's 11 acres that's owned by the city. Uh, these parcels over here are uh, privately owned. And so are these two. Uh, 453 and 501 Pine Street are also privately owned. The yellow boundary is the federal Superfund site boundary all around, uh, including uh, BED and DPW buildings uh, down to here, down to Lakeside Avenue. Um, Ruby, you wanna go on? Yes. So here is where we started our campaign to conserve and remediate the Barge Canal. On a cold day in mid-November, we gathered with friends and neighbors to consider how much the Barge Canal has done to heal itself and protect the lake. With debris from the land, late flowers and herbs from our gardens and paintings of mushrooms and birds, we created this collective offering of our gratitude. On that day, in a very real way, we committed ourselves to caring for this land. There are many reasons to conserve and care for the Barge Canal site. So we'll take a short drone tour of the area while we discuss them. Put on your seat belts, please. <laughs> so the most obvious benefit to Burlington is a healthy functioning wetlands habitat in the middle of the South End, home to mammals, birds, insects, plants, fungi, and microbes. The Living Barge Canal protects the lake by providing flood control for the south end and helps the city manage its stormwater runoff. It stabilizes the soil and contains and slowly transforms the toxins left over from industry. The Living Barge Canal sequesters carbon, creates climate resilience, and nature-based solutions to climate disruption. The Barge Canal has the potential to remind us of our history, indigenous, natural, and industrial history. Let's just watch this for a few seconds of its remaining. Okay, we're back to the map. At this point, the city of Burlington, as Andy mentioned, owns 11 acres in the center of the Barge Canal land, purchased decades ago in preparation for construction of the Southern Connector Highway. The rest is privately held. The small private parcels along the railroad track are wetlands and are already zoned for conservation. This is where our regeneration work needs to be started immediately. And we began this spring to care for the land we need to clean up the extensive debris for decades of neglect at the Barge Canal, 
Starting in April, there will be a volunteer effort to inventory the plants and animals on the public land. Non-native buckthorn has taken over large parts of the site along the canal and native species need to be planted and nurtured. We're envisioning the site as a forested parkland. Some see a botanical garden of diverse native species. We see an educational center with interpretive pathways to learn about our natural history, our indigenous presence on the land, as well as the obvious industrial history embodied there. There's a great deal of interest in using the Barge Canal as a laboratory for much needed cold weather bioremediation research. And the UVM class in plant and soil sciences has already designed their semester's project there. The Wildlands Park can offer safe public access with boardwalks and a public possible route through the bike path, through to the bike path. We would like to expand the conserved land to include all of the private land at the Barge Canal. We're exploring the idea of rematriation of the land. And that's opening to its original inhabitants for ritual and traditional uses by entering into partnership with our Abnaki neighbors. We have been active these last few months. Our main strategy has been to learn as much as we can about the Barge Canal and to get as many people aware and involved as possible. And you can help. Your voice is essential to conserving this land. The city needs to be a partner to help with the active regeneration of the land, including cleaning it up, as well as restoring and protecting the natural ecosystem. We did not expect the city to buy the two private parcels that are for sale. There is interest both in private donations and foundations to purchase the land. But now is the time to get involved. So write your city councilor, speak at public input sessions on South End rezoning, talk to neighbors and friends, show up for pop-up events, which will be happening, participate in citizen science projects that are coming up and visit the Barge Canal and sign the petition and that link will be included in the minutes. So our vision for conserving the Barge Canal land is a paradigm shift, a different way of thinking about development and open land and about our responsibility to clean up after ourselves, a different way of thinking about our relationship to our home. So we really appreciate this time with you to tell you something about this vision that we're carrying. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Ruby. Thank you, Andy. Um, do any of our per participants have questions or comments to share? We hope so. How many people, how many people have been down to the Barge Canal? Raise your hand. <laughs> So I'm raising my hand because I have a question. Okay. <laughs> I haven't I haven't actually been through the barge canal. I've been kind of on the on the periphery of it. Are there actually like are there any restrictions to to sort of like going and and walking? I, I saw some trails kind of in the in the satellite image. Like I assume people are doing that. I've never have. Are there restrictions to accessing the space? The the access to the space. Um, the answer, the practical answer is no. Um, the, uh, though you have to nuance that a little bit. Going in from Pine Street, you're crossing private land uh, owned by Rick Davis. Uh, and uh, he has never put up a no trespassing sign. He has never um, done anything to uh, uh, prevent access across his land. Um, we've asked, asked him for uh, permission um, to um, access the public land through his land because there's a UVM class down there. There's a St. Michael's class that's gonna be doing a, a case study at the Barge Canal. We're gonna be doing um, uh, this plant and uh, animal inventory starting in April. And Rick has been very uh, kind about letting people uh, just walk across. You can get there other ways. You can get there from the Maltex building parking lot. You can get there really with much difficulty from the BED side, but the easiest way is to just walk down there. Right now in the wintertime, you can go down to Myers Bagels to the end of the driveway and go on the ice. That's where um, most people are accessing and, it. And, um, and just walk down, walk down that way. Uh, and it's pretty well frozen, it's pretty shallow, so it, you can get there that way. 
So I see a question from Tom Hyde. Yep, Tom. Wow, I didn't realize. Oh, I just raised my hand because I had been to the barge canal. Oh. But <laughs> the fact <laughs> is that, you know, my impression is the barge canal, in addition to being a wild space, the a lot of the water from the streets in Burlington runs into the barge canal and through there and then out to the lake that way. And I have heard that you know, the street water is not very clean. It's got all the stuff that cars leave, but um, the water that runs out of the barge canal into the lake is as clean as the lake. So it provides a water, whatever, I don't want to say purification because the lake is hardly pure, but um, it does help deal with street runoff, which I think is kind of interesting. Yeah, that, that that's a really important point. At the the barge canal is a is a crucial part of the stormwater system in Burlington for for two reasons. One is the one you brought up, Tom, the the natural filtration that goes on um, from uh, just street runoff, just surface runoff. But there's also the major um, uh, combined sewer um, outfall overflow. Uh, in Burlington because of the combined sewer system, uh, stormwater and sewer system goes right down in back of DPW in, into the barge canal um, and depends on the barge canal to, as you say, filter it um, uh, uh, effectively. Um, and um, and the, barge, the barge canal land and the water are both essential to that. You know, I do wanna say that, um, the the land in the barge canal and i didn't emphasize this quite enough is that the um the epa when they when they made their record of decision they identified 56 contaminants of concern in the in the barge canal soil and these included obviously because of the coal tar hydrocarbons but also uh numerous heavy metals um, so a lot of work needs to be done down there now when when the the epa came in um in the 80s, their proposal to Burlington in the 1990s, early 1990s, was to scoop up all of the contaminated soil at the Barge Canal. I mean, really all of it, create this giant toxic waste dump, uh, 25 feet high and 13 acres of toxic waste dump and park it there by the lake. And people in Burlington looked at that proposal and said, uh-uh. Uh, really just rose up. I mean, I don't know how many people are on this call were part of that, but um, lots of people got involved and so did elected officials, city councilors, uh, Senator Leahy, um, uh, the mayor, and, um, and the EPA, after having proposed first a 30-day comment period, extended the comment period to six months. And then for the first time in EPA history, withdrew their proposed remedy because of the opposition. And for the first time ever, they created this council of local residents and stakeholders and scientists and um, let them come up with a solution, uh, which they did after five years. And um, really it was quite extraordinary process that led to this, um, this outcome that, that wasn't a, a huge toxic waste dump. So Andy, we have just literally two minutes left. Um, I have a question. I was wondering if Karen could quickly comment or just give us a minute of feedback about what you know about the city's position on this proposal. If you're there. You're there. Okay. Oh. Could, we, could we extend it if we talk more about the railroad? <laughs> Sorry, we still we preserved your time. We just we did preserve your time. I, you know, I, I don't know that I'm really in a position to comment on it. I know that I've received the information that uh, they have both um, that Ruby and Andy have both referred to. And honestly, I think it is probably uh, falls under the purview of the Parks, Art and Culture Committee. Um, and uh, uh, that is actually the committee that Joan 
chairs. Um, and I'm not, we have there, don't believe there's been a meeting of that committee in a while. Um, so I'm not really sure where that stands, but would imagine that that's where that would, where that would go. Um, so I really, I really don't know the answer to that, but I have, I have received all the information they have sent in, in April. I will be, I will be down there watching them do their inventory. Don't know that I can do it myself, but I will certainly be watching. Mm -hmm. um, Andy is, or, and Ruby, is there anything, I mean, you have a, another minute. Is there something that uh, you haven't had a chance to explain or comment on that well, you would like to? Well, I think that I can say that we have talked with every city official from Parks and Rec to uh, Planning Commission to um, Conservation Board. And we have found no support so far. And the primary reason is because the mayor has a plan for redevelopment of that land. And that's why we say that it is key that people let them let the their city officials know that this is an important development process. It's a different paradigm of a development. This is to centralize the land and what it does already for Burlington and what it can do for people. And just to remind you of the, the citizens of Burlington, there are 52 brownfields in Burlington. We're talking about a super fun site and partially a brownfield. And all of that land, we don't know how to do with it except to scoop it up and, and take it away. And our vision is that we finally stop and stop passing it along to Coventry or wherever it'll go and start to learn how to remediate the land ourselves. And we have a lot of information, a lot of, it's, it's, it's like the forefront of uh, research, scientific research now is how we heal the land uh, from those toxins, both containing them and actually healing them. And that Burlington could become, um, and there's much interest, uh, interest in this from UVM and from the Gund Institute and from St. Michael's, that it become a training center for bioremediation. Great, thank you, Ruby. It sounds like this is worthy of another installment down the road um, where we can hear more and as things develop and there's more to report. So- well, Could um, I just say one more word, Michelle, just like yeah. 30 seconds? Um, this will um, be discussed further down the road, especially when um, the uh, city begins um, uh, public input sessions on South End rezoning, which are, uh, haven't been scheduled yet, but should be coming up uh, in the next couple of months. And I think this will enter into that discussion. So I encourage people to be involved. And Great. sign the petition. If you sign the petition, you will get regular updates and you'll know what's going on, um, where there are meetings, what decisions have been made, where to, where you can have input. So sign the petition and you will get all, you'll find out everything that we find out, which. Okay, great. Hard. Thank you both. Thank you for your patience. Thank you for wading through the extended panel discussions and thank you for coming and putting together this presentation for us. Um, Thanks for including us. Oh, Thank you're you. very welcome. Um, Karen. I just didn't get my chance at the beginning of the meeting to say, um, wanted to second everything that Nelson said and then some about the amazing work that has been done on the MPA steering committee um, by Matt and also Michelle by you. Um, you've five years, I can't believe it's been five years. Five years certainly has a way of flying by, doesn't it? Um, you've, done, you've done so much work to bring this NP, these NPA meetings to life. And I think a lot of people don't realize the amount of work that goes in to developing the agenda, um, to um, assigning responsibilities, to making sure that the people are here, particularly in the Zoom era, and um, also to, well, certainly to Nelson and to Joel for, for continuing on, but also um, Michelle, thank you very, very much for five amazing years. Oh, you're very welcome. You're very welcome. It has been an honor and a privilege and a joy to participate on the NPA 
And Karen, you have always been there as a guidepost and a um, historical container of all that's come before. You've been a, a fabulous reference for us. And um, I really appreciate your just always being there to um, answer questions and you know provide your feedback and um, you know you have been a great friend to our steering committee so thank you great well with that um, I will say good night and thank you and this is my last meeting on the steering <laughs> committee on the Ward Six NPA and. Um, <laughs> It's been a really good meeting for me. I hope oh, it's not been for you all. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Have a great evening, folks. Thanks again. Thanks. Thanks. Have a good Thank night. You.